Now, this is a huge one, guys. This is what everyone has been asking for. Widow mine changes. And I really didn't think they were going to do much with this. So I was shocked when I saw these changes. All right, all right, all right. What the hell is going on, everybody? We've finally got a new balance patch being announced. Uh, and he said, hey, look, balance update, private test realm, the message from the balance council. And they posted this lovely post. Now, I am only covering this now because I just got off a plane yesterday. And my friend immediately messaged me, said, oh my God, this balance patch looks amazing, pig. And I was like, oh, did it finally get shared? Awesome. I've been waiting for this. You know, there's been discussion going on. I've been waiting for this sort of stuff to, to get shared. I haven't been very active in this process at all. I've been very busy recently, which is why I haven't been putting out as much content. But I immediately went and watched Harstam's video on my way home from the airport. And I wanted to just go over it with you guys and share my own thoughts as well, because this is a very, very big update. Now, you'll notice there is a Blizzard post, which is not too bad here. Um, but I think the better one for the balance notes is actually this Rentry post. Uh, as you guys can see, rentry.co forward slash 5013 balance test. Um, I'll put links to that down below in the description as well. So essentially they've said, look, from the previous patch, it was a big effort from the Community Balance Council. We'd like to thank everyone for providing feedback and to apologize for us not being able to communicate proactively. While we believe that some of the previous patch goals were successfully achieved, other goals, for example, related to the PVT matchup, are yet to be accomplished. Certain changes originally received mixed feedback from the community and also led to unintentional consequences, particularly in the case of Cyclones and Terran versus Terran, where the early game became just a Cyclone fest, which they were like, ah, we don't really want that unintentional consequences. We might need to revisit that. To be fair, there was not pure cyclone openings like for instance Ryung beat Clem in the WTL finals not using cyclone openings and Maru also was using a lot of non-cyclone openings but I'd say 8 out of 10 TVTs the early game is dominated by mass cyclone right now with the upcoming patch we'd like to take a more careful approach and focus on a fewer goals focus on fewer goals to improve the current state of the game the pro gamers involved in balance council feel the state of Terran vs Zerg and Protoss vs Zerg doesn't require any major balance changes a lot of people aren't going to be happy about that I've seen a lot of people already talking about this. Oh, Zerg's so imba though. Um, Serral is very imbalanced right now, and I absolutely agree with that. But I do feel at the pro level, there's been a very good shift of the power in TVZ and PVZ. And I think um, people can fight me on that as much as they want. But if you just simply look at the populations on the ladder, you can see that kind of a lot of the Zerg players for a long time that aren't Serral have been um, struggling, you know, essentially. And I think Harstam had some good thoughts where he said, you know, playing all three races, he feels like Zerg does struggle in certain stages in both of those matchups. He thinks, uh, I think he said he felt PVZ at pro level is about 55 Protoss, 45 Zerg favored. And TVZ, he's like, you know, it seems kind of even at the, at the top level, but in his own experiences playing it, it feels like even though the matches are pretty even, there's usually a, oh, if I just did this a little bit better, I'd be favored with Terran. I'm not sure how much I feel that scales down i still i don't know i feel like they're both very balanced matchups in my own experience but maybe that's because i'm watching the very tippity top rather than the 6.3 rank 50 rank 30 in the world players and pro players i think that's going to be really interesting to see so like for me it feels like it's very 50 50 depending on the day and and you could argue even worse than that because several i cast so many several and rainer games and they definitely skew those those win percentages pretty hard but i think it's it's telling that you don't really see the lambos the wanes or the um man who what zergs are there in korea other than like below solar shin shin and su shin and su uh i guess would be the two ones who, who I, I think have been really struggling in these matchups, DRG as well, really struggling in those matchups. And I think you have to account for all of those, whereas all of our attention goes so much on the top couple of top eight guys in the world that we sometimes forget about that. Anyways, let's let's move on from there. A lot of people are going to take the bait and already just be like, Ree, Ree. we'll see. Spats, uh, Protoss player says, Protoss 55%, 50-50 at best. PVZ. I, that's what Harstam said, Spats. It's not me. But definitely talking to a few of the top guys, like, they do feel... Like, I know, like, Showtime feels really happy and really really good in PvZ in, in some regards. I think Neural, Neural Parasite was the one thing that he was really annoyed at in Katowice. And he was, like, kind of mentally struggling with how to figure that out. But um, the Zerg... I know, like, yeah, Rainer and a few of the other guys have felt like it's definitely shifted much more heavily towards Protoss than Zerg. But I, I don't know. Whenever I see a PvZ loss, it's a skill issue, not balance, in my opinion, says Heaven. That's StarCraft in general. 
That's um, I think that's a, a bad argument to make, Kevin. I think that's a really bad argument to make. I know it sounds fun, but it's. I think I think there's always the thing is StarCraft's filled with with skill issues. Like, I I, I can watch the best players in the world and they're playing an amazing game. If we break it down slowly in a replay, we can find unlimited mistakes on both sides. So I think I think we got to be careful with that assertion. As much as I think it comes from a good mentality of we can always do better as players, we got to be careful to talk about balance in terms of well player made a mistake in the game therefore balance you know isn't important on the other hand you don't want to draw balance conclusions based on one match so it, it goes both ways anyway let's get into the changes let's stop talking about crap first things first guys liberator advanced ballistics range bonus reduced from three to two there are a lot of spots on oceanborn on uh sonic delta there's so many maps have spots where you cannot deal with lib range right now on the fifth base sixth base seventh base is all in the middle of the map and on the edges without having uh, a flying unit to deal with it um and that is that is a problem uh, zergs in late game have struggled with it we saw like a hard lead uh clem's liberator harass has won him so many games on hard lead because of that ocean born against protoss they then they've opened twilight they the number of games i've won just with libs on the edge of the map sieging bases that couldn't get here is insane so i think this is a good one it has the side effect of helping reduce uninteractive scenarios where there is often no way for ground units to see in range of a lib siege by mineral lines and allowing more freedom for map makers in base design for the first three bases it also says look protoss struggle in late game with liberated ghost bio armies especially after terran get a large number of libs with plus two weapons for those who don't know that interaction emp lands on the stalkers putting them to 80 life plus two liberators do like 85 damage a shot i think it is so or whatever the number is it's enough that they one shot the stalkers after they've been emp'd a stalker is not a cheap unit so if you've got like 20 stalkers they've got 10 libs and it does go in that way where the emps land and then the libs shoot you're like half your stalkers are gone the other half are gone and you're just like oh my god <laughs> so um definitely just making advanced ballistics a little bit less dominating in that liberator range now this is a huge one guys this is what everyone has been asking for widow mine changes and i really didn't think they were going to do much with this so i was shocked when i saw these changes invisibility while reloading now requires drilling claws instead of just armory so it used to be you build the armory widow mine's permanently invisible but now that is reattached to the drilling claws upgrade like it was years ago biggest one splash damage radius reduced from 1.75 to 1.5 that is massive that is such a big change now it gives an attack alert to the enemy when burrowing in range of enemy units so basically if a widow mine burrows near your workers you will get an attack warning um Harsten was saying you're probably not going to react in time to that and I, I agree you probably won't but like Ravager the same thing if a Ravager bios a unit you can do it and top pros will react in time but it might at least give you an awareness of what's happening so the follow widow following widow mines that burrow you know you can react in time and that sort of stuff and this means it'll kill less workers uh pretty regularly as well as be a bit less explosive um obviously a lot of people are worried that that's going to make widow mines not as useful against like Zergling Bane in general I still, I, I'm, I can't wait to see how this plays out in like back and forth Ling Bane games between like Rainer and Clem, because I don't know how much of a difference this makes. Because obviously it means like when everything's clumped up, it just doesn't hit quite as big of a splash. But because people are so good at defusing them anyway, I, I think this might just be like, oh, Widow Mines are 10% worse or 15% worse or whatever the number ends up being. Which I, if it can work out in that way, I think that would be perfect. And that's probably the goal. Problem, I think most people right now are saying, it's going to change nothing. Widow Mines are still super OP or they're now useless. I don't, I, I, I doubt it is on those extreme ends like most people I've seen talking about this change, but is it just the 10 or 15% or is it actually way more impactful and it ends up making the unit 50% less effective, which is way too much. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens there. Now, obviously you can see it now has a big thick red targeting line, which is kind of cool. So it's going to be much easier to see what the Widow Mine is shooting at and I imagine that carries over to multiple graphic settings as well. Yeah. So this basically is going to reduce how many workers die, they've said. It reduces game-ending moments when they're dropped in multiple Protoss bases with Armory. Because now you need to actually get a Tech Lab Factory and an upgrade. So that Armory Widow Mine drop build isn't going to be as easy to do. And it gives more counterplay through changes to visuals and alerts. So honestly, I think the community right now, I, I, I can't believe that this change actually happened. I don't know how good it's going to be. I don't know if the radius will end up going through. I think the other ones will definitely go through. I think the radius, if anything gets reverted, it'll be that one if Terrans complain too much. 
uh, you know, based off of the, the way the pro matches go. We'll see. Um, I, I, I honestly don't. I'm just, I just want to go test this really badly because this is such a big change and I, I can't wait to see what happens. Armory is going to be a little bit cheaper to compensate for the fact that it doesn't give that invisibility. So you save 50 gas on the armory. And engineering bay upgrades are also going to be 25 minerals, 25 gas cheaper on tier 2, 50 minerals, 50 gas cheaper on tier 3, which does bring them in line with Protoss, I believe. Um, Zerg attack upgrades are the same. Zerg armor is more expensive, I guess, because it applies to more units, right? Um, okay, so, so Terran's getting a few kind of small compensator compensatory buffs. I don't know how I feel about these. It says changes to slightly smoothing out the transition for Terran into mid-game upgrades. Partially offsets nerfs to other Terran units, as other changes are expected to have a greater impact in TVP than TVZ. So yeah, they're basically saying, hey, we want to give you guys something back. To be fair, Terran is the one race where you're almost always like finishing 1-1 and you never have the gas to start 2-2. So saving 50 gas on that and 25 gas and another 25 gas, that's 100 less gas to start 2-2 if you include the armory and the 2-2 upgrades. That's a pretty big difference. Um, I can imagine Pro Terrans might actually start consistently making upgrades against Protoss even with this change as well. Interesting. Cyclone is going to attack a little bit slower. Also, the actual lock-on spell is going to have a small, just under three second cooldown now, whereas before it had no cooldown. So you could lock on, kill a unit, or change targets, instantly lock on to any target at any moment. This means the Cyclone's a little bit less obnoxious with just constantly locking on to different things. It can still use its auto attack, but of course its auto attack doesn't have that extra lock on range. The damage bonus per weapon upgrade is actually going to be increased to compensate for this. Now, someone went and ran the numbers. You might be wondering, well, if you get double the damage bonus, doesn't that mean Cyclones are stronger? At tier one, they are significantly weaker. Tier two, they're a little weaker. Tier three, so when you get plus three attack, the, the new cy the Cyclone will now do slightly more overall DPS. It'll do a little bit more DPS, but only when you get the tier three upgrade. So you could argue the Cyclone as a kind of fleshing out your late game mech army unit is a little bit better than it was before. But remember the lock on cooldown is still increased. So overall, I'd say this is a overall Cyclone nerf, um, especially to the early Cyclone. I think that's good because it's going to just make the Cyclone a little bit less of a, a one size fits all shut down enemy units in the early game. Um, and I think a lot of people aren't too happy with the new Cyclone. So especially things like that Cyclone all in, all in are a little bit nerfed as a result. Now the weapon now has turret tracking. So it turns faster and they remove damage points. So I think they've made it so it, it can micro a little bit smoother. Even though these other things are nerfing it. But I need to actually hop in the unit tester and play with it to really see what the difference is with this. Oh, they've increased the health by 20. Okay, I didn't notice this before when I skimmed through. 110 to 130. Oh, okay. They're making the Cyclone a little tankier. Is this even nerfed then? This might be better. If it's more microable in these regards and it's got 20 more life, it might just be better. No, I don't know. I, I, I really need to test it. After the Cyclone rework in the last patch, the Cyclone has caused problems for Protoss players at professional level as a follow-up to Engineering Bay block strategies. Yes, most disgusting stuff ever. It blocks the Protoss natural, causes them to have to expand to a further base. As Hellion Drop and Cyclone Pressure are now both difficult strategies to deal with while appearing similar from a scouting perspective because all you see is Reactor Factory. Cyclones also have been difficult to deal with in early game TVT, causing games to often end up in mass Cyclone versus Cyclone early games and in various all-ins at lower levels of play. These changes are intended to make the unit less oppressive in the early game by giving counterplay to lock-on as well as reducing their damage output while making them scale a bit better in longer games through increased health and improved damage upgrades. In case these changes still don't improve the state of the Cyclone, the option to revert it to the previous state will also be considered... Oh, I like that! So this is it, because because like even my reaction is I find it really hard to calculate what all these changes add up. It's definitely better in the late game with plus three attack upgrades and 20 more life. It's way better as a mech support unit. And they've said, look, if it ends up being, you know, the state's too bad, like like it's too oppressive, we can still just, just revert it to the old Cyclone. Don't worry, guys, that's on the table. That is some proper PR speak right there. That is the Balance Council just being very open and honest and saying, hey, guys, if this is really crap in testing, we can totally revert it. So I, I actually really like that. It shows that they're thinking about how this is going to be responded to by the community and making sure they're kind of saying, hey, we've got our eye on it as well. We're not 100% sure either. We hope this works this way. We'll see what happens. 
Interference Matrix can no longer target units already targeted or affected by Interference Matrix. So the problem that could happen before, guys, is you could quickly spam Interference Matrixes down, button click, button click, button click, and you accidentally shoot two at the same Colossus. So, of course, all the second one does is renew the, the duration on it slightly. Basically, you wasted Interference Matrix. Or if you're using Rapid Fire to just hold it down and spam it across their army, which you normally would never do unless you're an absolute moron, um, that, then this means, yeah, once it's on one unit, it'll only put one on each unit. The reason why you wouldn't... I mean, it depends. If the three Colossus are all together, I think it's okay. But because there's Stalkers and Sentries underneath, if you spam Rapid Fire, you might accidentally do it on a Warp Prism... Random Stalker, Random Sentry, which is why I would I would never use Rapid Fire for Matrix unless I'm... Maybe it's like late game and there's 10 Siege Tanks on the ground in the TVT and then I can just spam Interference Matrix. Yeah, that, that, that's that's more of a scenario rather than like three Colossus on top of Stalker Sentry or something like that. That's okay. Just makes Raven Interference Matrix a bit easier to micro. Fair enough. Okay, guys, we've got more big changes here. We're going to talk about it in a sec. I'm going to take a bathroom break because we've got an ad about to play. So give me a sec. The Sentry is about to become the king of PvP. I have thoughts on this. I think it's going to be really good if you like doing the same opening every game. Uh, I think for everyone else, they might get frustrated. But hey, we'll talk about it in a second. Don't go anywhere. All right, guys, so this is really exciting. The Sentry, the new king of PvP, is getting plus four damage versus shields. A massive increase. And its light attribute tag is removed, which means it's not going to take bonus damage from Adapts or Banelings or Hellions. So it's a bit more durable against Zerg, against Terran, but also against those early Adepts that are such a big problem for sentries normally. And you're getting so much more damage as well. Now, obviously that plus four versus shields only helps you get through the first bit of your opponent's life, not versus the last hit points once the shields are gone, but that's still very a big, big impact on their damage, which sentry opening is going to be huge. Now, problem is, They've said, look, this is chart targeted at making the early game more stable in PvP, encouraging sentry openings, reduce the fragility of sentries versus adepts and oracles, as well as slightly increasing their damage. <laughs> On the other hand, problem, if everyone's just sentry expanding, does it get a bit boring? Maybe. I know this is every European Protoss player's dream, and it is, to my, to my extent, a bit exciting, um, but I, I do worry that PvP becomes a little bit samey, um, so we'll kind of see how it goes. We, we will end up seeing how it goes in, in terms of like, oh, uh, is, it too, is it too repetitive with everyone opens up, expand into seven centuries every game? And then are people rushing Archons to break the force fields? But then guess what? Problem, guys. Problem. Archons are all shields. They're all shields! <laughs> oh, no! Pylon, sight range increased from 9 to 10. Observer, build time reduced from 21.4 to 17.9 seconds. And health shields increased, so they get an extra 10 shields on observers. And their model size is a little bit bigger. And their surveillance mode animation speed increased by 75%. So basically, the pylon vision and the observer changes are to give Protoss general scouting and map vision in PVT. Protoss dies against Terran because they lose track of the Terran army. Terran kills a few observers and they are absolutely screwed. Um, the shield increase allows for observers to survive the splash damage of a single widow mine shot as well, which is nice because obviously we often see the observer just get taken out by splash and that's such a bummer. So that's actually really cool, clever targeted changes specifically to help Protoss's vision versus Terran, but they're also trying to make it so it's, you know, model size increase. They want to make it easier to see the observer. Harstam has talked about this, how as a Terran, it feels very unfair because the only time when you're being watched in StarCraft is when an observer is watching you and you don't know you're being watched. Normally, you know if your opponent has vision of you at a high level. This is a big, big problem. Now, keep in mind, guys, animation speed does not mean it sieges quicker, says chat. Also, this doesn't actually make it siege quicker. This just makes it easier to see. It means it wobbles and ripples quicker, making it easier to see. Thank you, chat. I did not realize that. That's awesome information from Yordle. So that, so it's going to be... A blur, so you're going to see the little blur, even if you don't have detection, potentially, a bit easier. And don't get me wrong, um, the Infester does actually have vision, so it's not just the Observers that give vision without your opponent knowing. But it is one of the more unfair things in PvT, where it's like, you know, sometimes you just don't realize you're being watched. You load up a drop, fly it out, and they all get shot down. That's always felt very bad as a Terran. If you were being watched in a game versus if you'd managed to find all the observers, it's such a giant difference in results. So trying to make it so you can get more observers, they're a little bit tankier, but also it's a bit more easy to be aware of the fact that they're watching you. I think there's a really good changes. 
Now guys, feedback can no longer target units with zero energy, much like the spamming feedbacks across Vipers or whatever. You might accidentally cast five feedbacks on one Viper previously when the Vipers are coming in stacked up to abduct your carriers. Now, once you've abducted it, you're not going to abduct, yeah, you know, once you've feedbacked it, you're not going to feedback it a second time. Great change so that you can actually pop, 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 pop and get rid of those units a bit easier. This really helps late game with that feedback on Infestors and Vipers. It's a massive change, really helps out. Now, Zerg, the Hatchery, Lair, and Hive have an extra creep spread radius. It was requested by map makers to allow for more freedom in designing the natural base layout without causing issues with Zerg wall offs in ZBZ. Oh, okay, that's a good change. So it just means the creep spreads a little further so that you can wall off with Evo Chambers and Roach Warrens if you do those builds. Whereas it used to be a lot of maps you just, oh, on this map I have to play Ling Speed and Banelings, even if I don't like doing that because the creep doesn't spread or you'd have to skip an inject on the natural, get an early creep tumor down so you can get a wall off and it would make those builds much less efficient. Now here's some big changes, guys. The Infester, Serral has got the Infester nerfed. Fungal growth range has been increased from 9 to 10. Wait, that's not a nerf. That's a buff. They've made fungal better. But vision range while burrowed reduced from 10 to 8. 10 vision is already one of the best vision in the game. The fact that the Infester had that while underground was ridiculous. I wouldn't mind that going down to 5 or 6 vision. Uh, once again, same thing. There's a unit watching you. You don't know it's there. That's kind of BS. That being said, they have tried to increase the size of the moving burrowed Infester visual effects. So like with the Observer, they're trying to make it more... Oh, there's a friggin' track of dirt there. Oh, there's an Infester. So if you're paying attention, you can shut it down. I don't know how well this actually works, though. They've also slowed down the unburrow time. So if you try to unburrow in range of some bio, you're almost always going to die before you get the fungal off. Whereas before, you could often unburrow, get the fungal off, and then die at basically the same time. So this is going to be really nice, where... They're just making it so it takes a little bit longer. On average, the minimum the minimum is going to be 0.18 seconds longer. The maximum is still the same. So not a huge change, but they're just meaning sometimes the Infestor would unburrow really quickly before. Now it's going to be just a little bit slower. Yeah, like I said, I wouldn't mind that vision going down further because I think it's kind of ridiculous that Infestors have so much vision. <laughs> Chat says, don't underestimate Dark. He also got the Infesta changed a bit here, not just Serral. But the extra range actually really helps, guys. I love the extra range. Uh, it was getting hard against high-level players to land Fungals. They were getting really good at just staying just out of range. This is awesome. But chat, but, but Pig, why is there random delay in the first place? Why isn't it set? It's because in, if every unit unburrows at the same time, it looks very unnatural. There's a lot of things like that in StarCraft to make it not look like everything is robotic to make it look more like an organic battle where units will all shoot at slightly different times or attack at slightly different times because if you have 20 roaches all go yeah 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 and there's like a fucking row of 20 dudes all doing that it looks really stupid so it's essentially something to create more of the lore and the feeling of the fights um is that things are all slightly randomized to create to break things up a little bit they're going to also increase the Overlord a little bit, guys. Um, they've made it so it takes a few seconds longer to morph, so you can't just morph them suddenly. But the actual transport itself is increased in speed by a little bit. They already increased it in the last patch, but they didn't really see anyone using it, so they're like, let's make it a little bit faster. And hopefully, since Zerg's harassment with Banelings being nerfed has, has been much weaker, let's try and actually get drop her play to be a little bit more common for Zerg. I don't think there's any problem with this. Uh, I think that's a great change. Why not? Now, here's one. Worker attack range increased from 0 0.02. Um, basically, workers would always lose target when an SCV constructing a structure would move to a different position. And this is going to reduce the frequency of that. You're not really going to notice the difference between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 normally. It's just for that one interaction. Cool. Fair enough. Now, they've also reduced the worker inner radius collision, collision with terrain structures. Basic, And they've also adjusted the footprint of Vespian geysers. And this has allowed these worker-only paths. You guys may not have seen my video. I did a video casting some games and show matches on this. Maps with this special feature. It just allows you these special paths where workers can go and kind of sneak out to take bases. You can create these like sort of semi-island bases even while rocks are still walling them off. Just a cool little change. Um, and I, I really like that. I think it's awesome. Zerg rocks have been added, which is a destructible, destructible expedition gate 6x6. So it's basically, you can see it's like a creep tumor with some Zerg stuff around it. And 
You can put these on the map to create rocks that lose hit points over time, naturally opening up pathways on maps. Just these are just cool tools for map makers. Mineral fields can now be destroyed by collapsible rock towers. They can't be attacked by anything else, but they can be crushed by rock towers, which is cool. These are just all fun little map features which allow map makers more creativity to give us some cool stuff. Now there's a bunch of bug fixes and quality of life. I'm not going to read through all of these guys, but I hope you have picked anything up. Let me know your thoughts on these balance changes. And let's very quickly just look through. There's a video here that Gemini did over on YouTube. Go check him out, guys. Let's subscribe from my Pigcast channel that I'm on right now. Um, and he's gone and done some comparisons. So the first one is we've got the Infester there. You can see it can just fungal from a bit further away. Next one, that's this single Infester vision. Okay, that's, that is more visible. Yeah, that's actually, okay, that's really good. When it's not moving, it's still invisible though. Keep that in mind. Infestors become invisible un underground when they're not moving. Now transport overlord morph time is a, a little bit faster. He's got the replay running on two times speed. Um, and here's the new movement speed. As you can see, the, the chonky slow boy is a slightly less slow boy. And that's... Yeah. And that was without overlord speed. This is with overlord speed. It's it's a pretty slight thing. Not the biggest change, right? Now we've got Lib sieging up. And notice... like That looked exactly the same. Wait, 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 what? Now, Liberators do kind of drift forwards. That looked exactly the same. Am I, am I post-patch, pre-patch? I don't think he tested this one correctly. I think he forgot to put Lib range on that, guys. Uh, I, I don't think he tested that one correctly. I could be wrong. That looked identical. Now we see the Widowmine splash radius change. And obviously, that's a very unrealistic scenario. So that, that was pre-patch, and this is post-patch, right? No? Okay, so I, in this scenario, I think it kills the exact same amount of, of units. Yeah, look, it, it killed the entire everything except the outer ring, and everything except out, out, except the outer ring. So this is not the best display of it. Oh, actually, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. The difference is the four ones in the corners all died here, whereas the four in the corners survived on the other one. So in this scenario, it looks like it's almost identical, and it's not a big change, right? It's a very, it seems like a very small change. I imagine with some slightly different unit formations and stuff, maybe we'll see it be more impactful. This does seem pretty minimal. If this is actually what it feels like in game, this allays any of my fears, like of it being too big. A lot of people are complaining about it being massive and making Biomine useless. Like I said earlier, that does not seem that big. Okay, we got Cyclones here, guys. So remember the lock on cooldown is a bit longer now and their regular auto attack damage is also huge. I don't know why the balance test mod was microing cyclones by itself, he says. <laughs> but it didn't really affect the outcome. I think he's playing on um, Rusty Shacky's mod. And Rusty Shacky has some built-in AI, uh, which maybe he forgot to turn off or something like that. Uh, uh, all right. I mean, that didn't change too much, guys. So the top is post-patch. The other one's pre-patch. So the thing is, remember, the, the post-patch cyclones are actually tankier. So yeah, post so people were so so the thing is people were saying to me the new cyclone getting nerfed is so this is so bad, but the, the, the new cyclone is actually in a basic A move fight here, it worked out to be better because of its 20 extra hit points, even though it does a bit less damage and locks on again slower. You can see survives with three verse two. So actually the new cyclone might be in some situ it's it's better in some situations it's going to be worse in other situations this is really interesting but this is once again tells us this because they changed so many things on the cyclone took away a bit of damage gave it more damage back with extra upgrades gave it more hit points it it micros a little bit better as well I'm like I don't I need I need to see this new cyclone in action a lot more I I'm sure they're going to still be fiddling with the cyclone and who knows maybe they revert it to the old cyclone which I'm still completely fine with Oh, and now he starts upgrading it? Okay. Okay, so if we go to like the level three upgrades is gonna be the biggest difference, which I think is this one, guys. So this is the level three difference. On the, on the top, you can see they have, they have a damage increase as well as the tankiness increase. But for whatever reason, the Stalker's Focus fired them a little bit better this time. 
So even though they should, this just shows how, how you need to test many fights over and over. Because guys, you're meant to get way, I guess the stalkers also had damage upgrades maybe? I don't know. It's just very hard to show in these little fights. So that this really is not a great example. Maybe the lack of micro at plus three made a difference as well. I guess the observer builds a little faster, guys. All right, let's see it siege up. Okay, chrono boost, you can see the difference as well. Yeah, it's not a big difference, just small. All right, observers, show me, show me the animation. Show me the animation, baby. Okay, so they're a little bit faster there. Ah, uh, okay. So they throb a little bit harder on the right, so it should be easier to see that, even if you don't have vision of it. Yeah, you see how it moves a little bit more compared to the left? Oh, that's awesome. So they literally have balanced the Observer by making it throb harder. That makes me very happy. And the Observer Splash, the Widowmind Splash doesn't kill it anymore. These are great examples. So here we've got a few sentries. You can see pre-patch at the bottom, post-patch up the top, and you can see those post-patch sentries do a lot more damage when it has shields. But once the shields are gone, their damage output does slow down quite a bit. Um, and you can see they're way tankier against the oracles, even though the oracles in the bottom split fire, whereas the top ones were focus firing a bit better. The sentries did way better against the oracles. Same thing against the adepts. Look, those adepts are one-shotting them on the bottom. Look at how big that difference is. That is so huge. Um, someone actually did a video where there was like 10 sentries against five archons, guys. And without the change, all five archons survived, two of them very low. Post-patch, two or three of the Archons died, which is actually really awesome. Can we just say a massive props to Gemini? If you guys want to please check this video out, the fact that he took the time to go make this four-minute video, this is amazing. Um, go like, subscribe. Thanks so much for putting this together. Really puts the changes in perspective. So far, I think these changes are really smart and really good. And it's why like, I, I often do feel like there is just so many clever little targeted changes coming from the balance council and i think most importantly this does seem like it's moving in the right direction like sentry openings being better against terran better against protoss um i mean it, there's just a lot of cool changes in here anyway let me know your thoughts below anything you've got uh you know uh, ideas about just remember to be civil um and uh yeah it's good to be passionate but remember you will only ever have your voice heard when you talk clearly calmly concisely the moment you start shouting at me or anyone else, unfortunately, even if you have good points, it's going to get ignored. I need to remember this myself because sometimes I get very passionate. I'm like, this thing's stupid. But I realize when I've actually want to make change happen, we've got to just try and explain your points of view a little bit better. I will be reading every single comment on this video. I know these ones are always a bit of a dumpster fire with people attacking each other. Please don't attack each other. Just try to actually learn. Any interaction you have with anyone else in my comment section on a balance video like this, try to understand their point of view. And try not to think of it as a tell them why they're an idiot and they're fighting against your race and trying to make your race worse and ruin your ladder experience. No one wants that. We all just want the game to feel fair, to feel fun. So be civil to each other. And I look forward to uh, engaging in the comments. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.